Um, so we, this is a monthly series we do, uh, started about a year and a half ago, exploring the ethical implications of technology. If you've seen the meetup, you see that it's um, pretty broad, everything from um, social media and social movements to the ethics of algorithms to um, uh, how race is treated in VR. Uh, out of curiosity, we just like to ask at the beginning, like who, who sort of came for the, the technology part? If it's ethical tech, who came because they're technologists and technology? A couple folks, cool. Who came for the half, some halves? Who came for the ethics part? Okay, one more. Who came for both? Okay, cool, yeah. Let's see what happens. Who came for something else? Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, yeah, we're just excited to be uh, doing an event with you, Greta. Thank you very much. Um, are you going to talk a bit about the digital ethical lab as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then to say as well, if there's, um, if this conversation, we keep it pretty low key, um, we'd like to keep it very uh, informal. If there's a conversation you want to have as part of this series later, please get in touch with myself or if you know Greta, um, she can connect it and uh, we can have that. Or if you need an event, Basically, we're a software consulting company that does these events um, uh, around emerging technology and social and economic justice. So you have, if you have an organization that does events around either of those, we're looking for space, we give it away for free. Um, so come find me or uh, or so with that, I'll turn it take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much, Duncan. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, and uh, I'm going to introduce these lovely folks in a moment, um, but I'm just going to say a few words first about the Digital Equity Lab, who we are and what we do. Uh, so we're a um, university center at the New School. We're relatively new. Um, it's myself and Maya Wiley, who's also the Senior Vice President for Social Justice at the New School. We co-direct uh, the lab, and our mission is to advance um, digital equity through applied research, convening power, and policy strategy. So um, we're just getting started, and this is one of our first events. Um, so we're really thrilled to be partnering with ThoughtWorks, and um, really excited to have these wonderful people here. And I also want to say thank you to Jolly from the Internet Society of New York City, who's um, running the live stream tonight, and hello to our Elsewhere audience. <laughs> 16 viewers. Whoa. All right, we right. love 16 viewers out there <laughs> on the interwebs. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to run down the line and just say your names, but I'm not going to actually um, give introductions yet to our panelists until it's their time to talk. But just quickly, this is Drew Marotra, Grayson Earl, Human Saberi. Darshana Narayan, and Ingrid Burton. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about who they are and what they're doing here in a moment. Um, but I first wanted to know if anybody, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lob a, a heavy, heavy one at you, so get ready. And I mean, I think, um, I just wanna acknowledge how uh, difficult this week has been and how um, so many of us are really reeling with the news that's happening and um, I think it um, intersects every part of our lives and um, I just want to acknowledge it and tell you all that I feel like it's with us in the room and that I hope that what we talk about tonight can uh, be a part of the work we have to do together. So um, starting there, all right. So this is heavy. Um, can anybody uh, identify the really famous ethicist um, and philosopher who said this? Humanity exists in its greatest perfection in the white race. Whites contain all the impulses of nature and affects and passions, all talents, all dispositions to culture and civilization and can readily obey as governed. They are the only ones uh, who always advance to perfection. Great ethical thinker, not Nietzsche. Oh, exactly. Immanuel Kant. So, um, do you guys know of Immanuel Kant? Other things about him? <laughs> um, his ethics, his morals. Anybody? Yes. No. Yeah. Uh, 
Please share. <laughs> I mean, what is there to say? Kant um, gave us the categorical imperative. Um, he gave us um, the moral law. Um, and Kant, like Locke, and like Mill, and like a lot of Enlightenment thinkers, who we consider sort of the grounding of our ethical philosophy, or we might even say um, the infrastructure, the, the intellectual infrastructure of ethics, um, a lot had a lot of sort of deeply embedded biases um, in the systems that they put out there. So I just want to start by opening that question of um, what are we talking about when we talk about ethics? Because I think there's been a lot of conversation recently around um, ethics and technology and how do we create ethics and technology and sometimes I worry that we're going to do it in a way that doesn't consider um, some of the, the flaws and biases that, that might be embedded in a tradition of ethics. So this evening is about rethinking ethics with intention. Um, so, you know, the other thing this evening is about is infrastructure. Um, and here comes Jolly. Don't, don't mind me. Okay, we're not going to mind Jolly. Um, so infrastructure is another place where biases and assumptions um, are often hidden and embedded. Um, and so when it comes to technology, um, there's a couple of places I'll mention where uh, we have hidden biases, um, or maybe not so hidden, but definitely embedded biases. So thinking about the internet and where it's good and where it's bad. Um, there's a lot of studies out there. I'll just talk about a little bit about Bill Callahan and the National Digital Inclusion Alliance who have mapped broadband systems and have demonstrated that um, where there's old copper line infrastructure, not fiber, um, and where ISPs don't maintain those systems or upgrade them, um, is almost geographically perfectly aligned with the areas that were redlined by uh, the Federal Housing Administration in the 1930s. And so redlining was a federal policy which said that banks could not lend to people to uh, get mortgages in these areas. Um, and therefore, um, there weren't banks, there weren't grocery stores, and those areas have continued to suffer from, um, you know, biases and uh, sort of hidden flaws in the system. Um, you know, I could talk a little bit about platform, platforms as infrastructure as well. Um, we've all seen the consequences of what happens when Facebook becomes um, the infrastructure of our polis, of our, of our uh, public space of discussion. Um, and so we really have what I would call a crisis in um, the, the infrastructure of technology. Uh, we have unintended consequences and policies um, that have led to the unchecked evolution of um, you know, these kinds of biases that reproduce themselves because they're embedded in the infrastructure. Um, and I, I would say that these are the unintended consequences of techno-libertarianism and market logic. So. Um, that is some framing for us as we begin tonight's um, discussion. And um, I have um, asked all these people to be here because they are imagining something different. Um, and they're thinking about how we could build different kinds of infrastructure um, that respond to some of the um, problems that have been created through a legacy of um, techno-libertarian um, deciding what we're going to do via market logic alone. So, first up, Dhruv Narotra, right here next to me. So you have your bio here, Dhruv. So, um, Dhruv is an activist and an engineer who's interested in social justice, policy, and politics. And he's currently an ar artist in residence at IBEAM and a researcher at NYU Courant. Courant. Um, Dhruv is also the network <coughs> operator of CESEL, which is an open source cellular network <coughs> located in Nicaragua. So I'm going to ask each of these folks to talk about um, what they're doing in their work uh, to 
challenge hidden biases in the, tech, the infrastructure of technology and in particular how they're employing the principle of decentralization or distrib distribution as a strategy. Um, and so maybe if you don't mind talking about decentralization and then distribution. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm Drew. Uh, thanks Greta and ThoughtWorks for putting this together and like it's a cool panel. I mean with friends, colleagues and people whose work I really respect so it's cool to be here. Um, so I, uh, I guess I should start by telling you a bit about myself. Um, yeah, I'm a resident at iBeam uh, and uh, a researcher at NYU and like lately I've been describing myself as a skeptical technologist that's like you know someone who's uh, skeptical of the promises of big technology, skeptical of the people who make it, and skeptical of like the fact that like, like, like that anything built in a world that's inherently violent and unequal will do anything but kind of reproduce those same conditions. So the work that uh, I'm doing and I think that I was, I'm, I'm here to talk about is my work building community networks. Um, so I'm the network operator of a um, open source cellular network in Nicaragua. Uh, we do we work closely with the uh, Caribbean on, on the Caribbean coast, which is a politically autonomous or semi-autonomous from Nicaragua, um, to provide a cellular service where to people who like uh, the market sort of forgot and neglected. Um, and then the other network I'm working on is uh, the other net, which is a community network in Bushwick. But in reality, it's not really a community network. It's like we're not trying to necessarily provide cheap access to the internet for everyone in the community, even though this does actually do that. It has, you know, we're able to provide uh, access. But um, the real question we're trying to explore is like, are there uses for the local area network uh, that, like what are the uses for the local area network? What are the possibilities there? Like can we build uh, software applications locally that can solve problems that the wide area can't or shouldn't? So Drew, can you, um talk a little bit about mesh networks and what that is as an infrastructure and how it's decentralized. Right, so uh, the network we're building in, in uh, Bushwick is a mesh network. It's um, basically the idea with the mesh network is that there's no real hierarchy of nodes. Uh, each uh, computer or each server or each part of the network uh, with store and forward traffic around, so it's more resilient to consolidation or to uh, you know, one per like the network being cut off by one node being shut off, which is a sort of different architecture than like all internet services typically are. Yeah, so I think there's been this kind of idea since maybe around sort of Arab Spring time that we could use mesh networks to kind of resist authoritarianism because if you have a decentralized network architecture then maybe there isn't a sort of authoritarian or central uh, power that could control or shut down the system, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so this is one example and um, Drew's work is, is starting to bring that principle to um, Nicaragua and to Bushwick. Right? right, yeah, and I think, I think with, with the promises of Mesh are that you know it's more democratic and it's also easier to like if uh, you can get one cheap access, you can get cheap access to backhaul to the wide area, you can distribute that um, more easily. Uh, but I also do want to like talk about I think the promises of Mesh. Like there, we talk a lot about Mesh and as like a the savior of uh, <coughs> internet and network topology, and I don't necessarily know if that's true. Like I don't think that like. Uh, like, I feel like you can mesh your network all together as much as you want, but the network won't fully be decentralized until you, like, take into account, like, the people who are actually creating the network and the people on your team and the people you're working with. Okay. So. Great. All right. Great. Um, next on the line, we have Grayson Earle, who uh, has a diverse technological practice unified by a political approach to media arts. And he employs video games, video projection, algorithmic, audiovisual generation, biological organisms, and robotics um, to intervene on physical spaces and entrenched ideas. Um, and I'm, ask, I'm asking him to talk about a 
project which has um, this idea of decentralization at its core, which is bail block. Um, so thank you so much, Grayson, and could you talk to us about what you're doing with bail block and what kind of infrastructure it is? Yeah. Um, on the note of infrastructure, I think it's important to um, talk about some of the uh, ideas that inspired the project, including um, something super relevant to what we're talking about today, which was the SETI at Home project, which I think happened in 1999. I could have some of these details wrong. Um, the Berkeley branch of SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, that was founded by uh, Carl Sagan and Frank Drake. Um, they kind of had a funding problem uh, because the market wasn't really interested in, in the ideas that they were you know, trying to achieve. So uh, they couldn't afford a supercomputer to crunch the data that was coming from the satellite array um, that was kind of like searching outer space for you know, various things that could indicate that there's intelligent life or something. Um, and so what they did was they created this software called SETI at Home that you could download as a volunteer and it would use your idle computer time um, to take in that raw data from the satellite array, crunch the numbers into a usable format for uh, researchers at Berkeley, and then send it back to them. Uh, and since thousands of people downloaded this software, they effectively created this ad hoc supercomputer. Um, and I always thought that was really interesting because you know this question about infrastructure, what is it? Well, it can also mean kind of the relationships that we have with one another, right? Um, and through those relationships, they created something, you know, materially effective. Um, and then, uh, in 2010 or so, I was really interested in cryptocurrency, just as a kind of a, I don't know, just a thought experiment. Um, and so I was sort of learning about mining and all this stuff. And I was working at a computer lab, and so I installed some mining software that would run while no one was using the computers for a couple of weeks. And, and this was when it wasn't really worth anything, so it wasn't as like shady as it sounds. Uh, and uh, sort of did this for maybe two weeks or something and mined like, two Bitcoin, which at the time was worth like $10 and today is like $15,000 or something like that. Um, I think I don't have it anymore. Uh, but uh, it, it stayed in the back of my mind as like a really interesting idea of how to kind of like generate financial resources out of thin air. And so um, after Trump was elected, uh, I was thinking a lot about how technology had failed us, uh, as we were kind of alluding to recently, you know, Facebook and the siloing, political siloing of ideas. Like the internet was supposed to counteract the exact kind of thing that we're now dealing with because people mobilized on that platform. Um, and so, um, I just kind of uh, hit on the idea to sort of combine these two ideas of cryptocurrency mining and SETI at home, essentially, um, and then teamed up with the new inquiry uh, and you know, several collaborators, including Drew. Um, and uh, we kind of decided to orient this distributed cryptocurrency mining software we call Bail Block um, such that it is uh, paying bail for people in uh, New York City and then uh, it's going to expand to people just around the United States. Um, there was this New York Times op-ed that came out, I think it was called The Bail Trap, although there are two articles and I always forget which one it was. Um, but it talked about how uh, our justice system has a basic assumption that most people won't take their cases to trial, like the vast majority of people won't take their cases to trial because they can't afford bail. Um, and so they'll get a plea bargain, right? So the DA will say, okay, well, uh, how about you take a guilty plea and then we'll let you off with a little bit of jail time or no jail time. Everyone will take this, or many people will take this because they can't afford the average bail of like $910. And if even twice the amount of people could afford this uh, amount, the justice system would collapse under its own weight because there wouldn't be enough judges or courtrooms in the United States to hear these cases. They're already hearing these cases at midnight on Friday night. You know? Um, and so it would necessarily impact policing because they, they wouldn't be able to continue to arrest people the way that they do. Um, and so Bail Block has this lofty idea of providing that money to people um, who, who need it and then sort of uh, you know, toppling the prison industrial complex one sort of community at a time. Um, just, just like a small goal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, and of course, in practice, it's not as effective as that, uh, as you know, we would love for it to be, but it does have the potential to you know, uh, 
you can download this application, bail block, and then if you run it in the background of everyday computer use, it will be contributing to this mining project. And we take 100% of the cryptocurrency that is generated and give it to our partners at the Bronx Freedom Fund. We're also going to be working with immigration bonds really soon um, to counteract ICE. And we just give it to them to administer and just straight up pay bail for people. Um, yeah, so that's the, the general idea of that project. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so Human Saberi. Um, next on the line, he is the Deputy Director of the Resilient Communities Project for RISE New York City. Um, and in this role, he's helping to build resilient community wireless networks, also mesh, in sandy affected areas of the city in partnership with local businesses, civic organizations, and residents. Shout out to Clayton Banks over here from one of the partner organizations, Silicon Harlem. Um, so, man, can you talk to us about what are you doing um, building infrastructure? What are you doing building infrastructure? And, um, <laughs> and how does um, decentralization come into it? Of course. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Thank you to ThoughtWorks for creating the space for us. Um, before I start, I do want to extend a special thank you to Greta. Um, you've truly been a leader and a very prescient voice um, in the field of digital equity and community networking. And I don't know how many other fields as well. So maybe we so, yes, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing with resilient communities. So, as Greta mentioned, um, we are building community owned Wi Fi networks in five neighborhoods that were sandy impacted across the city. So, we're in Hunts Point, we're in East Harlem, we're in Sheepshead Bay, we're in Gowanus, and we're far along the way. And so, um, what we're doing there is building these networks um, using small businesses as uh, the nodes um, throughout each neighborhood. And, um, uh, as part of this work, what we've done is we've, um, each organization has hired one individual who acts as a community coordinator. And, uh, we've trained uh, one, organi one individual per organization um, on our sort of uh, curriculum and our pedagogy um, for digital stewardship. So um, what this involves is um, working with, uh, with these community coordinators to do trainings um, of of local residents in each neighborhood in a fashion that's um, non-hierarchical, that um, you know meets the meets the, the learners, the digital stewards, sort of where they're at, engaging them on their own terms so that they're demystifying technology. And really, the, the <coughs> digital stewardship really isn't so much necessarily about tech, although there is the hardware and software components of networking that we that we train uh, the stewards on, but it's also about community organizing, relationship building, outreach. Um, and so this really gets to, uh, you know, I think what, what Grayson just sort of mentioned now about, um, about social infrastructure. We sort of view the digital stewards as the social infrastructure that sort of binds the communities that we're working with, with the actual technology, with this, um, with this mesh network. And I think we were talking a few days ago, um, and Ingrid had mentioned that uh, I think I guess Mark Zuckerberg had put this 600 or 6,000 word essay up yeah. about, I and mean, he he invoked social. Yeah, it was, it was a little. It was sorry, just, it was a little after the election, and it was like about like building community, and it, he uses the phrase like social infrastructure like 30 times without ever explaining what that means. Yeah, it's, yeah I mean I think he just meant Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> As I was reading it, I was trying to say, like, okay, what is he trying to say? No, 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 I got two paragraphs in, and I was like, this milk toast manifesto is not for me. I'm not, I can't, I can't reading this. Milk toast manifesto. Yeah. But what we're looking at here with social infrastructure, it, it, it is about relationships, but to add more to it, I would say it's about sort of the positive and healthy relationships uh, of trust between humans, between like, residents in these communities that can sort of uh, foster these collaborative uh, problem solving in a respectful manner. That's really what we're trying to, to do with digital stewardship. Um, and in the, power, in, in the process, you're empowering uh, each of the stewards with these, these new skills. They, are now, they have now built, they will be building, we're going into installation this summer, we're very excited. Um, but you know, at the end of the summer, they will have built their own piece of the internet that's, that's theirs. They'll have a local server for local content hosting. Um, and that sort of ties into some of these hidden biases in our infrastructure, which 
um, you know, treats uh, our usage of the internet in a, in a, as consumers, right? Not, in, not as producers. We're not producing anything. And, uh, I was recently in Detroit and I was taking a tour um, of, this, of the local networks that um, one of our, um, that's basically our sister project in Detroit. You should all look up uh, the Detroit Community Technology Project if you haven't already. But uh, basically this project, uh, this, this, uh, this group is implementing a project called the Equal Internet Initiative, EII. And it's a similar model. They're doing digital stewardship, working with residents, and you know, one of the tech trainers uh, that we met in Detroit had this really interesting comment about how our upload and download speeds are basically structured to force us into being consumers. And so I was looking into that a little bit more. And so you look at uh, what the FCC broadband definitions were in '96. So in 1996, um, you know, the, the definition of broadband was 200 uh, kilobits per second down and 200 kilobits per second up, so one-to-one -one ratio. We go to 96, uh, to 1996, and the FCC changes that definition to four megabits down and one megabit up. So we're now we're skewing the ratio towards being a consumer by you know, four to one. And then in 2015, that goes to 25 down and uh, what is it, three, three up. So. Maybe not for long. And maybe not for long, if we're lucky. <laughs> but that's still, regardless of, even if, if, even if this FCC doesn't change it, you know, we're still in this uh, situation where our infrastructure, our, our download speeds are sort of programming us to just want to consume more and more. And I think with our work, we're trying to you know, change that dynamic so we can actually produce and upload and share their, share their stories. Thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to mention also with both um, Drew and the work that Human's talking about, that mesh networks also give you the option of turning off the internet <laughs> if you want to. So you can you can either be on the global internet or you can just be local. It's up up to the community itself. So in a way, it's like actually really decentralized in that way. Also. Um, great. So next we have Darshana Narayanan, and Darshana, I have lost your. There's where's your bio? Um, Grayson, how did I do this? Okay, great. Darsha is a neuroscientist and a consultant, and she studies human behavior at multiple levels, which means both individual and organizational, and time scales, ontogeny, and evolutionary history. And she works on Polis, which is a crowd understanding platform used by govern governments, businesses, nonprofits, and communities for collective governance. So, Darshana. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please explain what ontogeny is? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> what was that? Oh, okay, great. Did I say it right? Ontogeny? Okay. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, Darshana, we would love to hear from you. Um, so we're talking a lot about decentralized systems, and one of the big questions that arises when you have something that's non-hierarchical or decentralized is, how do you govern it? How do you how do you order it? Who's in charge of what? Um, so, if you could talk a little bit about your work on governance and how you approach um, decentralization, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna step back for just you know, a, a minute and, and start with where where it all came about. Um, I study animal behavior as, as the ontogeny part of it, led me to believe. And which means I, I've looked for a very long time at how the brain, the body, and the environment together in concert shape behavior. I worked for a very long time with non human primates as an experimentalist, and now I work with human primates as an experimentalist. Um, and I sort of started off uh, with, in collaboration with Amanda um, Hedi, who's, uh, who's also a neuroscientist at Princeton. Uh, sort of thinking about how societal structures shape our behavior and uh, shape our brain, our body, our behavior. And that is our environment. We're born into these structures. They very heavily shape uh, everything we do. And we, it, through this work, we sort of gra started grappling with notions like progress or efficiency, which these are artificial terms that we have kind of made up and trapped ourselves uh, within and and in, in many ways, sort of come to think of as natural, right? Some people would go so far as to say, oh, survival of the fittest, the way nature works, capitalism is natural. You know, these, these sorts of jumps, which is, for the record, totally not the case. And, and as we, we went through this, we sort of started 
we, we realized that we had a value system uh, that was not, not neither of us were objective. There's no such thing as objectivity, and this, this value system really matters. And so for everything we looked at, we started putting the value system front and center, be it China or Facebook or Java, the cousin of Java, which, whichever uh, experiment it is, and started putting our value systems front and center. And it turns out that, that my value system is um, is that I would really like to see uh, a future of a plurality rather than the singularity, which is how I think about um, decentralization, which is really going after strongholds of power, breaking down those strongholds, distributing power, balancing power, um, and figuring out how we can, we can govern ourselves. And uh, I must give credit for the, the comparison to Orji Tan who came up with the plurality singularity comparison. And so in, in sort of thinking about how to do this or figuring this out, I've started like going out in the field and meeting people and uh, and questioning and figuring out uh, how experiments that are already succeeding at doing this have, have succeeded at doing it. And there are there are a couple of really remarkable cases that have completely restructured entire countries uh, by introducing decentralized participatory uh, methods or trying to you know trying to complete decentralization yet but definitely making more and more space in government for uh, for citizens and civil society. And two big experiments are one in is one in Taiwan. Uh, in 2014, they had uh, they had a movement that that really did open up space in government for a lot of uh, for a lot of experimentation. It, the, it was called Safra Movement. They they sort of supported legislative changes for a month and demonstrated to the government what they wanted a participatory democracy to look like. And the government was sort of shamed into um, into making a deal with them and opened up space for large scale participatory governance within within their central government. So they have they now have a very elaborate and very um, adventurous, I would say, process for um, citizen governments to gather to collaboratively craft legislation, programs, policies at a national scale. And citizens, they they part of the that sets up uh, the process. They have the power to change the process itself. And for every issue that comes in the table, all of the stakeholders are invited to the table. Um, whether it's private sector, public sector, civil society, government, and everyone comes as equals and collaborates to craft the future of their country. They have regulated Uber. <coughs> this way, they're one of the very few countries that hasn't had a problem with Uber because they got ahead of this problem. Um, they have uh, sort of put up legislation um, to, to to govern or to, to figure out what to do with, with revenge porn, uh, which has been a bit of a deal. So you can imagine whole countries sort of having deliberation of what even revenge porn means, right? what, what intimate images means, things like that, which they did. Um, they have regulated unmanned drones this way. They've also built some, some amount of social infrastructure. Their tax platform was uh, co created with citizens in, um, citizens in government. Spain is another big example. After their Indignados with the 59 movement, uh, they had political parties both at the local and the national level that really fully embraced participatory democracy. So, Madrid, for example, has this platform called the Syria Madrid where citizens put up proposals for what they would like to see in the city and everybody votes on it and then the city council carries it up there. It is that they, they're not questioning what comes at the top, they are not the will of the people or carrying out the will of the people. And they, they've redesigned you know, town squares, physical infrastructure using this method but also co-created their human rights um, sort of chart of the city using, using their participatory methods. Um, there, there are many such these sort of examples like this happening, which only just sort of introduced me to something that's happening or something that works in the uh, a, a decentralized governance model on the internet uh, that the internet corporation for assigned numbers and, and names which is, which is very elaborate and, and quite incredible and for all of these things you, if you have one that many people in a decision making process you need good tech and it is and it's necessary that tech matters so some of what I do is help build this tech and, and a, a platform that was created after Occupy, so we can listen at scale without you know, these hour-long uh, processes, and without the pain of it. Um, has been is being used in a number of different countries, and I'm helping build out this platform. It's called Polis, and we go on the platform. Whoever sets up a conversation around the issue in Taiwan, it's their citizen government task force. Um, 
there are a couple of statements there. You either agree, disagree, pass on the statements, and if you don't see your sentiment reflected, you put in your sentiment, and then the next round, the next set of people get to see your sentiment and vote on it, and then the, the conversation just keeps sort of generating itself. But in real time, there's machine learning algorithm that both surfaces these statements, but also visualizes and churns through the information, showing opinion groups, showing areas of consensus and divisiveness. So all of this information can be taken in without it being sort of overwhelming for whether the human uh, or humans are who are who are orchestrating this or playing the task for taking care of this to digest it. And um, the platform is being used in a, in a couple of different places, Singapore, Taiwan, a bunch of different places. It could be used in New York City very soon, which would be really great. Great, thank you so much. Um, great, okay, so um, I, I'm gonna um, introduce Ingrid Burrington. <coughs> and I don't know how I keep losing these files, but whoops, now I'm losing my papers. Um, Ingrid is um, an expert on infrastructure, which is not in her bio, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, and she, oh thank you, she writes and makes maps and tells jokes about places, politics, and the weird feelings people have about both. She uh, wrote the book, The Networks of, or it's just Networks of New York, an illustrated field guide to urban internet infrastructure. Um, and sometimes she gives tours, if you're really, really lucky, um, maybe someday you'll go on a tour with Ingrid to see infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to um, ask you, Ingrid, to reflect on some of what you've heard. Um, we've heard about decentralized infrastructure in terms of network infrastructure, distributed uh, information architecture, the blockchain, um, governance and movement building. So that's a lot of different kinds of infrastructure that all touch technology in different ways. Um, and so, yeah, okay. please. Cool. Thank you, Greta, for having me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the live school. The live school. Um, I, yeah, it's, I'm also always a little bit humbled like being last year because like I mostly just write and like. These are all like, you know, very distinguished and accomplished like makers of things and organizers and like the thing that I do is like largely document and write about and, and try to I mean frankly like in when I started doing this in 2013, 2014, I was kind of trying to make infrastructure interesting to people who would not otherwise care about it because you know the the familiar jokes that all the infrastructure as you know, that infrastructure is this thing that like people only really care about if it's broken. And like there is a way, you know, even back in 2013, where I have there's sort of this instinctive understanding like something about the internet is broken in this like fundamental way that kind of feels maybe like a promise or something else, um, not necessarily like a busted cable. Uh, but simultaneously, like the visual vernacular and a lot of the narratives around how people use the internet and interface with them and live with the internet. Um, tend to be very like myopic and tend to have a lot of really shitty metaphors and like even worse <laughs> clip art. Um, like, a, lot of so what, bad. a lot of what I feel like got like like what actually kind of got me down this rabbit hole was um, in 2013 when all the, the Snowden stories started dropping. Like you have these really long, dense stories trying to like parse these like complicated government documents and then you have these like stupid images. Just like like Either, either like you know just like slide decks that like were kind of visually incoherent, um, or like someone would like some like somebody on like a deadline would like go into Shutterstock and search like surveillance and like get a picture of a lock and some ones and zeros and some like matrix scanner sort of shit. Uh, and I remember thinking at the time like I don't know what the internet looks like. It probably doesn't look like this. Um, and the thing about going kind of into the field and trying to like seek infrastructure is that. It becomes really abundantly clear um, how many people you need to make it work. Like my probably my best sources for working on uh, field guide uh, as a book were people working in open manholes in New York City, uh, like just going up to beat like Verizon trucks or whatever in the middle of the night um, because nobody thinks the people who do that work and like they keep the internet running basically um, uh, and and like give like. They're more than happy to, like, I mean, it also helps that I'm, like, a small girl. Like, I think that, you know, there's, like, if I were, if it's a little bit easier for me to be like, what you doing? Kind of, like, dumb. Um, but, 
I think, yeah, generally the work that is like underappreciated in like how the internet operates is like some of the most interesting. Uh, I'm trying to going through like some of the stuff that came up in the conversation, just taking a lot of notes. Um, I guess within that, like one of the things that I think is really great about uh, the work that you and come on uh, have been doing is the way in which um, that organizing and the training and pedagogy really challenges the assumption of kind of like who is the tech worker um, and who is the like kind of like expert. Uh, I think the legacies of like how we like like the legacy of looking especially like sort of like computer history and like internet history tend to like really emphasize like those like single guys like in you know either like Mark Zuckerberg in his dorm room having like a super wicked cool idea. <laughs> Um, he was in Boston, so maybe he would have said we did. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, or like the image of like, you know, the singular sort of thing is like Steve Jobs alone in his like turtleneck or whatever. <laughs> or like the guys in like Xerox Park in a fucking beanbag chair. So like the people who are absent <laughs> from those stories are like the millions of people required to like operate Apple's supply chain to make the iPhone work. And, you know, absent from like, like you know, the the of, of Mark Zuckerberg are like the millions of content moderators. Well, it's more like tens of thousands, but you know, they love it to be less. But I think you get my point, and I think one of the things that I love about the work of building local networks and and the ways in which also like the, the like thought and care that goes into the pedagogy, especially with the resilient community stuff, is the ways in which it really demonstrates that like you need all of the experts. And it is all valued at the same level. It's not like, ah, you're the one who knows how to code, therefore you're like the hero of the fucking story. It's more like a richly populated uh, RPG. Um, and feel that way sometimes. Right on, is that, should I say more things or am I? I think, I think what I, stuff? that was great. I think okay. that um, what I want to do is um, I want to open it up for you folks to ask um, questions, um, I am going to ask you to ask questions um, and um, with a question mark on the end of them. Um, I, there's a couple of things that um, I would, I, I just want to throw out there to think about as you formulate your questions. Um, first of all, I want you to think about, so we've all, we've heard about some really principled um, ethical, if, if we can still use that word, um, work that's happening led by these folks. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to just think about this idea that um, decentralization and distribution, right, is a principle that we've heard them all talk about. Um, but I want to ask, you know, what's the flip side of, of um, distribution or decentralization. So what, what might be an unintended consequence that we're not thinking about? Um, if we just take decentralization as a, as a good quality, a good design quality, and one that will help us route around authoritarianism, for example, what are, we, what are we not thinking of? Is it possible that creating decentralized systems could actually split us into different realities, like if our reality more and more becomes sort of defined by the information we're consuming? Is it possible that we could have communities with their own infrastructure, which is you know defined by really great social values, and communities with their own infrastructure that's defined by really terrible, what we might consider really terrible social values? Um, and I also want to think about um, another point is that, you know, we have to think about what we should do to avoid those unintended consequences. So if you have questions about how to do that and how these folks are thinking about avoiding unintended consequences in their work, that would be great. Um, and also, if you have a question about a term you didn't understand or um, a concept that was unclear, please feel free to ask those questions. I think sometimes those can be the very best questions. Um, because we're all talking about pretty complicated stuff. Um, so, with all of that, does anybody want to lead us off with a question? Or does anybody, oh, Clayton Banks wants to lead us off with a question. So I'm going to just try to be sort of practical. Yes. And I'm a, I'm a corporate business-minded kind of guy, who's a non-profit sort of thinking. 
so the challenge that I have often with mesh speaking, if you will, is the sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, when I look at the future, and so I do have a question for Kumar and whoever wants, wants to answer it, but when I think about the future, I think about everyone being connected and everything being connected. And I'm curious if this movement around mesh is going to take all of that into consideration when you look at infrastructure. Infrastructure is the same as it was when America started. The idea behind infrastructure is to make our lives better. And the great news now is we've got better tools to do it. The question I want to ask is the infrastructure that I've been hearing on this panel, or at least some of it, is sort of thinking about mesh and democratized broadband in some ways, and you know everyone has a stake in it and all that kind of stuff. In my value system, it makes a lot of sense, but from a business perspective, I'm thinking when we have autonomous cars and we have, um, you know, uh, city tech-enabled uh, devices and all types of things going on, there's a certain amount of, of um, need, I think, to have, you know, real money behind that. <laughs> I think there's got to be real money behind our smart bridges and smart streets that are coming. So I'm curious if that could be a sort of a, one of the drawbacks, if you will, right, to your point about is there a you know sort of unintentional consequence is that those neighborhoods today that don't have broadband, those neighborhoods today that do lack great infrastructure, stay in that space because the world keeps moving faster and faster. So Human, you might want to approach that. But do you think about I feel like the sustainability, looks sustainability of that show, or, there, or anybody? <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, and I, I kind of want to start by uh, disputing the statement that um, that the idea around building infrastructure is uh, making people's lives better. Um, insofar as state constructed infrastructure is often, it is also an, it's like, yes, it can make people's lives better, but it's also kind of an instrument of defining social order, right? Like the, you know, U.S. interstate system was like it was like the national like alternative for like defense and highways act. Like it was a military driven initiative related to like the Cold War. And that's not to say that it's not helpful, but it's like I think maybe in thinking about like what the economic model would look like, there's also the question of like if you had the will to have state like investment in it, like trying to understand like what's in it for like a government. I don't really know if I trust this present government to. Um, Commit to supporting infrastructure in a meaningful way. I think we've had like four infrastructure weeks in like the last two years that are really not much, and also uh, to continue to exist. Uh, that's maybe helpful. Um, but I think in terms of like why I think why infrastructure gets built, right, I think it's important to consider that it's like it, it does. It's it's not like solely just like oh we have good intentions, right? The, the fact that it doesn't meet some people is kind of well, it's completely been, uh, all three of those revolutions have created inequity. I get that. Yeah. That's that's clear. I mean, I've seen neighborhoods on the wrong side of the track only because of infrastructure. That is an uh, issue of who is at the table for designing, yeah. to Darshana's point, which has primarily been men, men with nice degrees, men that grew up in suburbs, men that have, you know, cars and garages, men like me. That's how I grew up. And that's how I designed from an engineering perspective, not because of anything except that's my prism. So I get the fact that there's infrastructure bias, which is why I came here. The question is, what are we going to do about this next fourth industrial revolution where all of our infrastructure has to be upgraded? Will it be designed the same way in the past to create divides? Or can we have Yashan and Greta and Puma and everybody at the table and poor people and rich people and everybody come together and say, how do we make sure that this infrastructure is going to make our lives better and equitable for everybody? Right, and I think Amen, if you want to, if you, you know, as you're talking about IoT and the Internet of Things and all the connected things that are going to, you know, mushroom up in the city, it's still going to run on a base level of connectivity and internet, internet connectivity. And I think with our work, demystifying that connectivity and like laying down the building blocks for like how, what the internet is, how it works, and how you can build it yourself 
is that sort of first positive step to getting people ahead of that curve. Because you're right, you don't want to constantly be chasing the thing that's that, you know, developed a few years ago. Um, and so I think you know, getting being as inclusive as possible is a way to uh, mitigate against any sort of like unintended consequences that we're looking at because you know one person's unintended consequences and others lived experience, right? So yeah. I would add to that that I think it really helps to have pressure in civil society, right? The, the threat of people sort of rising up and making making a fuss, not to bring the revolution down immediately, but it does help it keeps it keeps the pressure on and that's what allows space. Yeah, and then I guess to combine both of those things, right, where we're filling in the knowledge gap means that you can actually apply smarter and more directed pressure as well, right? And the more you can actually educate people about the right demands and the most targeted demands, the more you can, you can fight that, you know, the infrastructure gap that you're talking about. With a decentralized pedagogy, uh, each, you know, each community group, like what I would love to see is like each of these five be training another five communities each so that you know slowly the work that's just these sort of five separate islands of connectivity around like locally built and owned connectivity around the city are spreading and linking up with each other. And that's right, like I just to, to put a little cherry on top of that, it's like I am hiring a digital steward who's been trained by Human's group to train the stewards that I'm training as well. So this stuff is actually happening, which is interesting. Infection. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a contagion. Yeah. Yeah, that's an awesome point and connects to organizing and um, part of what Ingrid mentioned, I think the word you were pointing at is labor I and mean, the, the labor that undergirds the entire system, but then also sort of the question I have is how do you, uh, taking this Sunday of education and decentralization, then how do you get people to be aware of uh, their stake or their potential agency in these processes? So like. You know, how do you, how do people become aware that they could participate, or that they um, that their participation and their engagement with these issues actually has some sort of agency? Disco techs. Uh, their discover <laughs> technology sessions. Yeah. Um, so it's <laughs> part of my part of good idea. <laughs> no, but entertainment does help. Like many of these events seem to be so boring. Yeah, so boring. <laughs> 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 Entertainment. It was. It was a. It was a party. A disco. People would show up. They're like, you want to, like, in some sense, like, seduce people into participating. Totally. And that's and that's what a disco tech kind of does. Is that like you know you have these discover technology sessions held in community uh, organizations or places where individuals or residents of the neighborhood feel comfortable going to. These are spaces that are not alienating. They're the ones they're they're familiar with. And you just sort of lay it all out. Like we, when we, we did one in Brownsville, and we did um, a demonstration of a portable network kit, which is something we've developed on our team, which is basically a Wi-Fi in a, in a suitcase. And so it, it really is just like a beautiful, clean, simple way to show how you can build your own piece of the internet. Uh, I think a good, uh, good example is how the Soviet Union introduced, you know, the farmers uh, introduced everyone to the industrial age with these really beautiful propaganda posters mm. that were just like very artistic and had these fun slogans and gently sort of led everyone to the four things went to show. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's speaking of unintended consequences. Well, maybe they were unintended. I don't know. But. No, it helps. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Do we have other questions? Worry? Um, Roy Solomon, everybody. Tim <laughs> 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 uh, For those of you whose names I don't know, please feel free to ask, to ask questions also. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for convening this and thanks for the great uh, talks. Um, I want to ask a kind of like grumpy, skeptical question. I'd like to try to get my thoughts organized and try to bring a little bit of um, kind of like a dilated historical perspective. So as you know, I've been studying mesh networks quite a bit, and somehow over the last few months, in my interest in decentralized networks and mesh networks, I've found myself really going deep in studying broadcasting. Um, and if you get into kind of like the history of a lot of these, the same underlying technologies of mesh, like wireless radio communication and so on, um, I think you can identify a kind of symmetry over like maybe a 90 or 100 years kind of period where like, you know, radio was invented in like 1890s, and the first couple decades were like very much what we would consider 
a decentralized communication network. It was two-way, peer-to-peer, ad hoc, insanity. People started broadcasting new stuff, and then 1927 was like essentially broadcasting, like the birth of like clamping that down. And so I think there's a certain symmetry now, like that we're seeing maybe shifting back, using radio technology to kind of attempt to kind of go back to this kind of other mode. So my grumpiness kind of comes in because if we think about what other things that happened in that kind of like 90 year period, there's a lot of things like the accumulation of vast nuclear arsenals, mass society, um, globalized supply chain networks, and all these kind of other crazy social phenomena that maybe are kind of tied up in more like centralized information circulation networks. So like now, I think when we see these kind of shifts towards decentralization, decentralization my question for everybody is, how can we kind of like, do, are we ending up with this kind of like chicken with its head cut off kind of phenomenon where we have a kind of like mass networks of, of, so, you know, of social organization, but without kind of um, the capacity for like a social cohesion around like coherent truths and the ability to like understand some of these or, or manage these massively large scale phenomena. And so like thinking about decentralization, one of the people is like really psyched off decentralization is like Steve Bannon. And he's been like studying like the, 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 the history of the Catholic Church to really understand how decentralization can challenge a, a massive authority. He's trying to like actually like crumble like globalized networks. So like how do we work towards decentralization without encouraging these other kinds of like social crumbling and things like that. You know, is that is that a possible kind of thing? I mean, I think this is a, this is a big question. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I think distinguishing between decentralization as a technology and decentralization, and decentralization as like, you know, a social practice is an important thing to do, right? Like, I don't think you can build, you know, the internet we want until we properly have a world that we want to, re to be reflected in the internet, right? So I think there's like, there's two kind of threads to that conversation, right? I'm not sure if that made any sense, but... To add to something you said earlier is that, yeah, this, it's about the
the other version is kind of just thinking about like how you change ownership of means of production across that supply chain, right? And think about like who is like managing and maintaining all of those pieces of the supply chain, but as it presently exists, and like you know, Matt Hockenberry, who you know and who the rest of you should know, is much more eloquent on these things than I am. But uh, I'm probably just showing the lots of clever things I said. But we shall just get through this. <laughs> but I mean, I think that's a great question, and it's the question that. Um, I sort of started with is that if we take um, decentralization as like a default um, good principle of design, right? And this is how we're going to um, cha you know, change the internet for the better. This is how we're going to make the next internet is to decentralize it. I think we do have this question about fragmentation and kind of loss of a central organizing principle. Um, and, you know, I think um, Clayton's point is also well taken in terms of, you know, we risk the, uh, we risk having sort of tiers, right? We risk having some people who have access to driverless cars and amazing technology, like, <laughs> what what all is out there? I don't know, flying um, yeah, stuff, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, on the other hand, is self-determination and the ability to control, uh, you know, the technology that, that you interact with, is, you know, is that worth the price of kind of opting out? And then what about people who can't opt out? Because there are a lot of people who can't opt out. So I think, you know, this is really uh, absolutely like something we're not going to fix tonight, but uh, a seed that I think uh, that I want to plant for people who are working in this field to think about, um, you know, with respecting the the crucial role that people and technology are playing by organizing to create technologies that are not harmful, or or refusing to participate in developing technologies that are harmful, right? So I think we all have to think about the unintended consequences, and that goes for decentralization as well as any other, um, you know, surveillance tech or. AI or any of that. Um, you had a question right here. Yes. Fairphone, is that like list Fairphone or like this? <laughs> <laughs> AI? I think I think it was some Dutch guys. Please someone help me out if I'm getting this wrong. Um, but they basically were trying to like, you know, demonstrate that you could like create like a consumer market available like smartphone that where you can kind of like trace like the sourcing of all of the minerals that were used in it and vet the like conditions of its manufacture and say like, you know, basically no no humans and or animals and or, you know, soil was harmed in the making of this smartphone. Um, and audits of their their like process, like there are there are definitely like gaps in like how far they actually could manage an audit of the chain because supply chains are murky. Um, and I think it's like a really admirable objective. It has limitations simply kind of by the way that the entire kind of manufacturing system has been constructed around it. Does anyone remember the names of the dudes who made that? I, I didn't catch the name of the dude, but thank yeah. you for, for yeah. the Fairphone um, yeah. thing, which I haven't heard of and probably no one has heard of <laughs> because you know. Well, because yeah, and also like it's. I think not that many people. They didn't make that many. They so, didn't get that. It's also like <laughs> definitely it's, prohibitively expensive too. Yeah, they're also really expensive. And it turns out if you want to make a, a, a you know ethically source where everyone's getting treated well, yeah. it turns out it costs much more. Just like fashion. So I want to. Um, I think that we're we're sort of at a limit of <laughs> abstraction <laughs> at this moment. Um, so I want to uh, take it home, um, just have you guys just say one quick sentence, right? And so I think that I really want to think about this idea of, of scale, um, and that's sort of that's sort of coming up in um, the question that Rory asked and the question that Clayton asked. Um, you know, so if we're talking about these kind of like renegade, these little like insurrections, these little sort of like infrastructure insurrections, um, how do we do it? at scale because obviously right now we're at a moment where we have to think think about scaling up all these things that we're doing that um, have a, a seed of resistance and of, of principle in them. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you have not been paying attention. <laughs> um, so 
So really, really quickly, what are you going to do to scale your work for the revolution? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what revolution? The revolution. The one that's going to happen. <laughs> All right, or you can answer the question, what revolution? <laughs> no, but I'm really interested in scale because I think it's a really, it's a really fundamental question. Um, I'll say that we had this conversation about a week ago at the Allied Media Conference, and um, I want to quote Diana Nucera, who said that radical solidarity is love scaled up. Um, and that is how Diana Nucera is building wireless networks in Detroit. Does anybody want to go first? You guys don't have well, to go I was going to mention the Diana thing. Oh, sorry so, about but that. But that's okay. You did it. You did it way better than I was going to do it, so I'm very grateful. So I'll just say, yes, love. And two, just a lot of training and training of trainers and just building capacity and knowledge and understanding. And being prepared. Like, don't, don't wait for it to come up. Be prepared in advance and learn from people who have already done it before. Whether it's a it's a movement or an uprising, what do they have to get in place? What infrastructure? You need internet connectivity, which is going to be blocked. You have to you know get products and all whatever it is, food. And there are people who have tried this out, and we can. <coughs> the nice thing is now the world is sort of you know where we have the challenges, but also the benefits of globalization. We can teach each other, learn from each other, make friends across paths, and I think that is too. Um, second, in the solidarity thing, I think the, the expanding also kind of who within that struggle for building better tech is like part of that, that challenge, right? Um, like, as the, you were alluding, I think you were alluding to the, the recent sort of like attempts by tech workers to like be like, hey, billionaire, maybe stop making the bad thing. And I, one of the things that I found really remarkable about um, those letters, because like, particularly like the Microsoft Ice contract one, was that at no point did it mention like in it that perhaps there are people who work for Microsoft who may be affected by this, mm -hmm. right? Like because the idea that there are janitors who clean the Microsoft campus who might have family in El Salvador, like that somehow was not part of their like expanded frame of like why this might be a problem for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the idea of thinking who is in your kind of like who, like, who are your people in this struggle? And like, how, how do you bring everyone who has a stake in this, like, and everyone who's kind of touched by this like kind of behemoth system to the table is like a piece of trying to, to solve that puzzle. Mm -hmm. And also maybe just having like a power analysis because like with the Amazon letter, like nobody who works at AWS signed that fucking letter. They like, they're screwed. Who signed it? Like, I mean, it was like product manager people, people on the retails. I should not know that. I don't think that that's like public. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, the point being, like, looking at who's, like, how you're actually leveraging power in organizing, if you're, like, if, if it's on the level of, like, how will people inside these enormous companies make their, you know, oligarch CEOs bow down, that's, I think, a big part of it is, like, having practice and thinking about who are your people. Is anybody confused, like, does anybody not know what we're talking about? <laughs> Just wondering, you guys, anybody have a question about it? I'm, I'm specifically not aware of the petition at, at, at uh, Amazon. So, Amazon, the petition basically, or an open letter to Jeff Bezos about the recognition facial uh, rec program that they were doing with the police. And um, they, like, I think it was like a hundred ish people, so it was like not that many people, and then like, I did some asking around, just like, who's actually signing this? Is this people who, like, have our services, you know, like Amazon's corporate social responsibility team isn't even allowed to audit Amazon Web Services. Like that's out of their purview. So I don't like I think that if we're gonna like make this part of like like you know in terms of like trying to like hold them accountable, you have to think about who within the large fiefdoms that is like the many fiefdoms of Amazon actually has like power and influence. In this case, AWS is the only source of like is the main source of real revenue the company makes. So if they don't care. But there have been successful, there have been successful. Insur insurgencies at um, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google uh, where workers have said, we don't want our companies to participate in mm -hmm. um, some of the things that are happening. Just say, um, part of that was also pressure from shareholders. Mm -hmm. and Great. I know in, um, like, uh, relating to the border wall, Project. Um, 
some architecture firms were in the running for um, participating in the procurement process, and um, I have a friend who actually organized at the company he worked at, which is like a massive engineering architecture firm, but he got both workers, but also got shareholders. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of this pressure from <coughs> below and above that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in these sort of structures, the, the power of workers comes through organizing, but then also being strategic about knowing what can mm -hmm. undercut you know, the actual business model. So it's yeah. So any, anybody out there from Thomson Reuters, we've got your back. <laughs> We're there. We want to help you. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was the name of the movement? It was really cool. Oh, not our wall. Oh, not uh -huh. our wall. Yeah. Um, all right. How about you guys? Yeah, I mean, I want to kind of return to this question about like the problems of inherent decentralization and like recognize it's essentially a conservative ideology. Uh -huh. um, it's something that capitalists love, and we should be really careful and sort of fetishizing it. Um, you know, like the problem with Tahrir Square and Occupy Wall Street was like these management systems emerged without any political content, mm. and they were destroyed by <laughs> content. Um, and you know, any like good Marxist knows that before you sort of like dissolve the state into like worker control, you need a very strong, very centralized, uh, you know, like mode of redistributing resources very intentionally and like recognizing the sort of like the lesson that Robespierre learned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I hope that you know we we don't view decentralization as like the uh, end goal, but rather like a momentary strategy uh, or strategy that can be used throughout, you know, different movements to kind of like outskirt our adversaries, whether it's like the DMCA or like Comcast or yeah. whatever. Um, we still need to like create a body, a union of workers in this country and in the world to swiftly, you know, uh, erase the damage that's been done over the last few hundred years and like establish something powerful. It also feels that once like, we're locked down in a structure and many cycles of that past, it becomes corrosive, right? So we have to be kind of adaptive to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. You, you spoke of your scientific research and you said that for sure um, that's not correct. Yes. Could you expand upon how you know that? is not correct as based upon your animal research. I found that fascinating. Yeah, sure. Thank you for that question. It's a long lap. So stop me whenever. OK, I, I might say, let's do that. Let's first have um, Human and Drew answer the question of scale. And then you already answered. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you did. Drew. OK, so I had there's a few different <laughs> threads I want to pull on now. But I think with the question of scale, which is going back to your question and Rory's question, um, especially in terms of infrastructure, like um, you know, equipment and infrastructure, like if we're providing things like cellular service or telecommunications, there's a kind of responsibility that it's stable, right? And um, I think some concrete examples I can think of of people who are really trying to solve the question of scalability on these local networks and these kind of federated networks, which is something I also want to talk about because it has to do with Grayson's, uh, what Grayson just said. But um, like Geefy does something really interesting. They're like a, 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 mesh, a community network in Cat Catalonia, right? And they, what they do is they allow uh, the resale of internet on their networks, kind of creating more of these ISPs within the network that kind of share into the system. So allowing that kind of growth and self-sustainability of these networks, I think, is, a, is an interesting strategy. Um, for real sustainability, because you're right, like to build infrastructure takes a tremendous commitment and a ton, a ton, a ton of time and effort. It's hard. So yeah, scalability is real. And um, like re with regards to capitalism and fears and all this shit, <laughs> like I was reading something today um, from the EFF, right? We, you know, in theory, like the EFF. And they said something that kind of like pissed me off because it was just like they were framing the solution to. Uh, you know, to a free internet in terms of competition. If we only we could have more competition, the internet would be freer. Which is kind of bullshit, because it's just like putting like this neoliberal frame around the problem of uh, what's wrong with the internet without thinking about intent, right? Like, actually, really, it's competition and all this like, like uh, 
insane drive to make the most amount of money, which has led to us being in this situation that we are in with the internet. So I think like another way to, to look at this problem is something that Darshana said a little bit ago, which is intent, right? When we're building this stuff, let's have like a, an intention that isn't the bottom dollar, right? The bottom line. It's, like, mm. it's got to be something a little bit uh, more interesting than that and also like less harmful. That's great. Okay, so now that we've all talked about scale, um, Darshana, would you please... Um, oh yeah, so, so much of this is, is kind of based on, on how inheritance is thought of, right? And, and the framing is that it's genetic and certain things are hardwired versus not when you have these genes passed across generations and it's attributed to Darwin and Darwin himself would be shocked because he never thought about it that way. It was a reframing based on you know, social and political context, which is like how much a science works, is like it is also viewed through some kind of framework. And so I say it's it's wrong because there are actually multiple inheritance systems. Genetics is just one of them. Our culture, there's cultural inheritance, for instance, our symbolic inheritance systems, these stories we tell ourselves, these narratives, these whatever, whether it comes in the form of science fiction or even the news or whatever, these that like, carry on across generations, they're passed on. We, we mix them up, the way we view the world is through these lenses, which then shapes how, how we behave. And so this is just one of, this is a lens that in some sense was created. So as, as a scientist, so what percentage, just as a guess, is genetic as opposed to the stories that we tell ourselves, which is very germane to this discussion? I think that's, a to that's, that's not a useful framework for for analyzing things, analyzing the nature of your framework is a totally not useful framework because you have a predisposition to something, but things trigger that disposition and it can be, you can hit that trigger, you may not, and it can be very many other things. I don't know, with random example, but like a dung beetle, the size of the dung beetle is not genetically determined, it's the size of the dung that's gone on, and it can be like a giant horned male that can reproduce or nothing at all, or like not. And so there's all of these other factors that can play in this like a whole, Myriad of them which you can buffer yourself against or you know sort of fall down a hole on in and so given given the whole sort of possibility the better way to look at it is almost like a, a waterfall where you have like ancient bedrocks put in, you have you know a stone falls in, it could be some temporary change or it could keep falling in, we call it cause a more permanent change, and you know sort of it could break off into two streams and those could create different behaviors. So it's it's a it's a much more dynamic system mm. than this this very sort of clean so you, don't, you, you don't you don't have a guess as and to uh, what is not we'll, it doesn't we'll, that have, really doesn't we'll have some time to to chat after this um, I just want to follow that beautiful waterfall analogy uh, with thinking I mean so Rory you you brought up radio right in the 1890s and um, you know what happened which was the FCC was created to regulate radio on the on the argument that um, you know ships were gonna crash at sea because there there was nobody regulating um, the radio waves so like nobody would get these emergency communications that argument has been made many times <laughs> um, Ronald Coase made that argument um, he's he's a you know great um, sort of early neoliberal thinker who brought us um, you know the idea that um, externalities are necessary and that you know basically like we should all um, shoulder that we as people should shoulder all the burden of externalities created by industry um, so you know this, this kind of question of control comes back again and again and again right and even before radio uh, there was the telephone system and there was the kind of you know in Tim Wu's book he talks in the master switch he talks about like all the millions of like different telephone systems that were out there and the need, you know, basically that Ma Bell um, was created to uh, make sure that everybody could reach each other on the telephone. So we, we, we have a natural monopoly in telecommunications that's been around since the, the 30s, right, because of all these things. And now with the internet, we're at another one of these moments where we're kind of struggling between control and the eruption of, like, insurgency, right, insurgent infrastructure. So, you know, this question of intention again comes around and I think, you know, that's the the seed that hopefully we've we've planted with everybody. Um, and you know, I'm so glad that we've examined the question of decentralization as a principle 
and um, you know ask that question of you know with intention do we you know does it grow into an authoritarian um, control system or does it grow into uh, what another great neoliberal said, like a million flowers, <laughs> right? Um, or like sort of how do we how do we create something different? Um, and how do we shape intention? Which is also what Octavia Butler would say. God has changed. It's one of the best change. descriptions of God. Yeah. So we started with infrastructure, and now we're at radical solidarity. God like and revolution. Like that's, that's a good like, band name and or conference. Yeah. <laughs> I'm down. Also, Milk Toast Manifesto. <laughs> that's a band name. Yeah. 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 Clayton, do you have the last I word? Just, is that I just have one thing. Just yeah. Quick thing to say is just to three components to it. When you talk about infrastructure, and I think one thing that sometimes is a blind spot is people don't think about it. In our neighborhood up in, in Harlem, 40% of people don't have broadband in the home, and a large part of them don't even have a device in the home. So you don't want to forget that it's important to get affordable devices in the home beyond a cell phone. And the second piece is we ought to explore the idea of community servers, mm -hmm. servers that are serving the community, because it's not about the equipment, it's about the content, right? In other words, people have need the tools to get to what they need to do, whether it's look for a job or finish a report or do whatever. And the infrastructure right now is built to where a lot of people don't have access to an Adobe Photoshop or an Adobe uh, this or Microsoft Word or any of that. And I think it's important for the practitioners here to not leave that out of the discussion. Having connectivity is absolutely important. <laughs> Erickson report says that the, the connectivity of a home that has no broadband can increase their household revenue by $500 a month. That's significant. It's life changing. But if the home doesn't have a device, it, it can't get there. So we have to make sure that we look at this as a whole ecosystem. It can't just be limited to the fact that I can connect the router. It's got to have the infrastructure in the home. And you made a great point in the very beginning, which is we have to do digital literacy. Most of the community is illiterate, including some of us in this room don't even know the speed we're getting in our home. So we have to get much more literate in order to make the um, internet re relevant. But trust me that people in certain areas and people who may not have gone on to college and got great degrees and can talk intellectually in a nice meetup are going, I can't wait to watch, you know, the next show on television, you know, that's right. what they're looking for. Well, that's what we all, and I think that's also a good point is that everybody, you know, we all, we all want to have fun too. <laughs> like, it's, you know, like, there's this idea that like, you know, people who live in underconnected communities should use the internet to, to do their homework and get a job and, you know, that's, you know, very, um, Listening, so. okay, okay, just one, can, can I have one thing? Can we just like ditch this universal income thing and have universal infrastructure? It just makes so much more sense. Yeah. I don't think someone handing me five hundred dollars. What am I going to do with it? And, you know, this, this world is no, expensive. That's not, that's, not what, that's not what I said. But no, 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 I, no, I no, agree no, with you. I'm, saying, I'm right? adding to what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, your problem, like that. Yeah, we should all. I totally agree with that. Yeah. So I think we should. Um, if you guys want to continue and talk. Uh, we'll stick around for a minute, or I will, and I can't speak for these folks, um, but um, thank you all so much for um, being here tonight. Thank you. 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 Thank you.